بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing with the series of the heaviest deeds pertaining to good character, which will be the heaviest of the deeds in the scale on the day of judgment, as mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. So today's topic is going to be a topic pertaining to the manners of du'a. And whenever one speaks about du'a or listens to information pertaining to du'a, then this brings joy to the soul. Because the soul of the believer, whether he understands or he doesn't understand, whether he realizes or he doesn't realize, the soul of the believer is in desperate need of du'a to its creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the soul of the believer is only in a state of tranquility when it humbles itself to its Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the believer only enjoys sweetness when he develops that relationship of servitude. That Allah is my master and I am his slave. Everything I need of goodness or protection is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no benefit I can gain. There is no harm that I can ward off except that it is with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then this shows you that the reality of our lives revolve around calling upon Allah subhanahu wa, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Momentarily, in every moment, we need to call upon Allah Azawajal, whether that be by actually raising your hands and making dua, or even more important, or just as important, having your heart continually in the dhikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in the remembrance of Allah Azawajal, being attached to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala by relying upon Him and calling upon Him, and realizing how much you need Allah Azawajal, because the moment we turn away from that, that's when we start to slip. That's when we start to slip bit by bit. So the believer, he enjoys this topic, listening to it, reading about it, pondering over it. And due to the important benefits of dua and knowing how essential it is to the well-being of the believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it obligatory. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ عُدْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ إِبَادَتِي and your Lord, he said, he proclaimed, call upon me, I will answer your call. And those who are too arrogant to call upon me, they will enter into the hellfire disgraced. So we ask Allah's protection that we be from those who are too arrogant or too heedless to call upon Allah. So the benefits of calling upon Allah are many, and the mannerisms pertaining to this topic are many. The righteous... In life, the righteous people, those special people, the lucky people, we ask Allah to make us from them, Ameen. Whenever they ponder moments or situations wherein they see the workings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how Allah through His power and His ability, He solves particular situations for people. Or He brings about rizq for people from ways which, how on earth did that happen? Or He brings a calamity into a tranquility or something which was negative into something which was positive. Allah does this all the time throughout the earth to many people. So the righteous people, when they look upon those situations, it causes them to get excited because they then increase in iman and they understand even more than they already did that Allah is going to answer their du'as. So what do they do? They rush off and they go and make du'a. And this is what is mentioned in the Quran about Zakaria salam in Surah Ali Imran. Every time Zakari when he was taking care of Maryam السلام, he would enter upon her in her private place where she would be worshipping he would find fruits of the summer at the time of winter and he would find the winter provisions at the time of summer something completely amazing because in the first place where did that provision come from? she was in the mihrab Secondly, not only was it provision, it was provision that should have been in the summer, but it was found in the winter. So when he saw that, he said, Ya Maryam, anna laki hadha. He said, Maryam, where did this come from? She said, min indillah, from Allah. Inna Allah yazuku man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab. Verily, Allah provides for whomsoever he wishes without restraining, without restriction. What happened to Zakaria? He saw that. It affected him. At that moment, Zakaria got excited. His iman, he had that iman rush. 
and he ran to worship Allah Azawajal. He ran to make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Though he was very old in age, and though his wife was very old in age, he called upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for provision of offspring, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala granted him that. So this is how we are supposed to be. We should always reflect when we read the Quran and we see something amazing about Allah's ability, about His power, about His mercy, or we see that in our lives happening to us, or we hear a story of somebody who's trustworthy narrating that such and such happened to him, that should automatically increase us in Iman and go, cause us to want to make dua to Allah Azawajal even more so. So dua, as some of the righteous they said, it's a conversation that the person enjoys like no other conversation. Even the one who is 110% in love with his spouse, the conversation that he has with Allah Azawajal for him is more enjoyable than the conversation he has with his spouse. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, a knowledgeable person said to me that when I need something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah azawajal, he opens for me such delights and such enjoyment of calling upon his names and attributes and getting to know those names and attributes even more because I'm sincere in calling upon Allah azawajal through them. I experience so much joy. And I experience the tranquility of humbling myself before Allah Azawajal, that I come to the point in my dua that I don't want my dua to be answered. Of course he wants the dua to be answered, but what he's saying is that the enjoyment of that calling upon Allah Azawajal with the need and the humbling of himself and conversing with Allah Azawajal is so enjoyable to that person at that moment that that is, that, is, that is the position that he wants to remain in. That is the sweetness that he wants to continue. And some people have experienced that. When you have a real need and you are crying to Allah Azawajal, and you are desperate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's closeness, that experience is more enjoyable than other experiences. And at times you want that to always be there for you. But of course you need the dua to be answered and Allah will answer the dua. But this is how the spiritual people are. This is how the righteous people are. May Allah make us from them. One of the adab which is extremely important when it comes to making dua is that you have to beautify your dua with good deeds because you are presenting something to Allah Azawajal. You are raising your hands and calling to Allah Azawajal. So how should those hands be? Should they not be clean? Figuratively, I'm speaking. Should they not be clean or should they be dirty? They should be clean, of course. So in Bukhari, we have the Hadith Qudsi where Allah Azawajal, where the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, مَنْ آذَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whoever harms or is, shows enmity towards a wali of mine, a wali meaning somebody who's close to Allah Azawajal, then I have declared war upon that person. And my slave doesn't come closer to me with anything more or better than the obligatory deeds that I have made obligatory upon him. When you do your obligatory deeds, you become close to Allah Azawajal. وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَّقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ And if you do beyond the obligatory deeds, the nawafil and the sunnan, then you continue to come even closer to Allah Azawajal until the hadith said that Allah Azawajal loves that person. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتَهُ كُنْتُ سَمْعُهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ وَبَصْرُهُ الَّذِي يُبْسِرُ بِهِ وَيَدُهُ الَّتِي يَبْتِشُ بِهَا وَرِجْلَهُ الَّتِي يَمْشِ بِهَا And if the person reaches that stage where I love him, then I become his sight by which he sees. What does that mean? Allah will protect you to only see those things which Allah Azawajal loves. وَسَمْعُهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهَا بِهِ And his hearing by which Allah will be for him is hearing. He only hears that which is pleasing to Allah Azawajal. And his hand by which he reaches, he will only reach out that which is pleasing to Allah Azawajal. And his feet by which he walks, he will only be walking to that which is pleased, pleasing to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then the hadith continues. It says, وَإِن سَأَلَنِي لَعْطِيَنَّهُ And if he was to ask me, I would give him whatever he asked from me. وَلَنْ سَتَعَاذَنِي لَعْوِيذَنَّهُ And if he was to seek refuge in me, I would give him the refuge that he requires. So what was the point from the hadith? The point from the hadith is you see the steps that Allah has laid out for the slave, that you take these steps of perfecting and establishing the obligatory deeds, then going beyond that by establishing the nawafil and the sunnan, then you reach a stage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects you. And everything you ask for, he gives to you. That, of course, which is beneficial to you. So we mentioned that this is a hadith Qudsi, and please raise your hands when you answer questions. 
what is the meaning of Hadith Qudsi? The meaning of Hadith Qudsi, it has a variety of meanings from the meanings or from the definitions is that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through inspiration or dreams, through inspiration or dreams. The meanings were revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's like the Quran in that sense. It was a, it was a revelation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed it in his own words, okay? So the Prophet ﷺ received the revelation from Allah Azawajal, but conveyed the meanings to the community in his own words. This is one of the definitions of Hadith Al-Qudsi. Which direction is it recommended for us to make dua? Easy question. Towards the Kabla, towards the Qibla, very good. So this is something which is very recommended when you want your dua to be answered, that you sit or you stand and you face towards the Qibla. The hands, when you make dua, they should be raised, and they should be raised high if possible. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith in Tirmidhi, and authenticated by Shaykh Al-Albani in Jamia Saghir, where he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيِّيٌّ كَرِيمٌ يَسْتَحِي إِذَا رَفَعَ رَجُلْ يَدَيْهِ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يُرُدَّهُمَا صِفْرًا خَائِبَتَيْنِ The very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shy and so generous to the extent that when a person raises his hands, making dua to Allah Azawajal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes to return those hands empty-handed. You'll never lose out making dua. The only ones who lose out is ourselves because we don't make the dua properly or we don't beautify our dua in the way it should be done. The more dua you make, you never lose out. Allah Azawajal is shy to return your hands empty-handed. When should you not raise your hands in dua? When your hands are dirty, very good. We said that you have to you have your hands spiritually clean. During Juma, what do you mean? You're right, but what? When the imam is on the dua. So when the dua, when the imam is on the member and he's making dua, he's raising his hands, then it's not legislated for the for the um, congregation to raise their hands. Why? In the hadith in Sahih Muslim, and a part of it is in Abi Dawood. Umar ibn Ayba, he said he saw Bishr ibn Marwan upon the member. And the part in Abi Dawood says that this was on Jum'ah when he was making dua. So this companion, he saw this and he said, Qabbah Allah wa hatayn al yadayn. He said, May Allah azawajal make ugly these hands that are making this dua. Serious statement. Why did he say that? He said, Laqad ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ma yazidu an yaqul he said, verily, I saw the Prophet ﷺ in that situation with my own eyes, and he wouldn't go beyond with his hands by doing this. And then he made, he pointed to his uh, pointing finger. He said, this is how the Prophet ﷺ used to make dua when he was on the member. He would point with his finger whilst making dua, not raising his hands. So what is the wajhul dalala? What is the wajhul istidlal? How do we derive then the proof that the congregation shouldn't make the dua. So I've established for you that the imam on the member, when he's making dua, he shouldn't be raising his hands. He raises his finger, right? So what is the proof then from this hadith that the congregation do not raise their hands in making dua, according to this opinion? Ahsant, you have to follow what the imam is doing, right? It's like being in the salah. You follow the imam in the salah, in his movements. Likewise, he's the imam on the member. He's doing the act of worship. You follow him in that. So this is what many of the ulama say. And I also remind ourselves that, look, when we learn something new like this, and we find that people in our community are raising their hands, we shouldn't make trouble. We shouldn't go and tell them, oh, you are doing bidah, you are, you know, you're wrong, you're this, you're that. No, you just educate the people. If they accept it from you, well and good. If they don't accept it, you move on. Let's not make trouble in the masajid. Let's not cause havoc, right? When we learn something new. When we learn something new, we educate and we edify. And we move on, inshallah, by Allah's permission. What is the exception from this that I've just explained? Ahsan, the dua istisqa. If the imam is on the member and he's making dua for the rain, then in that situation, he raises his hands. And also, the congregation will raise their hands in that situation because this is how the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was. From the adab of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softly. You don't raise your voice when you're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَّةً Speaking about Zakaria 
praising Zakaria when he called upon his Lord with a calling that was soft and not very audible, not very loud. Imam ibn Taymiyyah he said about this, he said that this shows that Zakaria was praised. Why? Because he had a close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you call upon somebody in a soft voice, you are understanding that they are close to you and not far away from you. Somebody who's far from you, you need to raise your voice, right? But Zakaria Islam, to his connection with Allah Azawajal, his understanding of the names and attributes of Allah Azawajal, his continual worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, he established a very close connection between him and Allah. So he called upon him in a soft voice. And a soft voice shows you that when you are in front of the king and you understand the magnitude of the king, and how great the king is that you will call upon him with the most polite of speech, with the most respectful of speech, to the extent that you can hardly get your words out, right? That's how it's going to be. If a king comes to us, we can just about say the words that we want to say. So Zakaria Islam, he embodied all of this when he was making dua out of respect to Allah Azawajal. He said it very softly, right? Allah Azawajal says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاءِ إِذَا دَعَان فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Allah Azawajal says that my slaves, when they ask you concerning me, O Muhammad, then tell them that I am close. And tell them to respond to me. I answer their calls when they call upon me. Tell them to believe in me and respond to me so that they may be guided. So this tells you that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is close to us. He hears every single whisper. Not only does He hear your whisper, He hears the whispers of your mind, which nobody else on this earth can hear. He hears the whispers of your hearts. He hears what you do not hear. He hears what you are about to hear before you even said it or before you even thought of it. So Allah Azawajal is close to you in ways you cannot imagine. But what does it mean when I say that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is close to you? Through His knowledge and His power. Through His knowledge and His power, Allah Azawajal is close to us. Not through His being. So we don't open the bedroom door and we say Allah is here, right? We don't say things like that, that Allah is everywhere, He's part of the creation. No, He's distinct from His creation, but He's with us through His perfect knowledge and His power, okay? So everything from His power can reach us, and everything that He wants to reach us will reach us. And knowledge, He's well aware of everything that we do, everything that we think of, everything that we whisper. From the mannerisms of the dua, is that the person should be fully aware of what he's saying. So many of us, when we make dua in Arabic, we don't know what we're saying. How do you want your dua to be answered? You don't really know what you're saying, right? You've heard somebody say the dua, you go ahead and say it. That's good. It's a good start that you are trying. And Allah Azawajal will still give you. But imagine if you knew the meanings of the words that you were saying. Isn't that really how a conversation should take place with someone that you love? You love somebody, but you don't know how to communicate to them. Isn't enough time has passed in our lives that we haven't learned Arabic? Should we start to learn some of the language that we can communicate through the Quran and through the du'as and the salah? Let's make an effort, brothers. It's not difficult. Step by step, we can reach that goal, but we have to make, take a year out of your life where you're going to insist, me and my family, we will study for one year. And I guarantee you, after one year, you will have a good foundation where you can understand what you need to understand to communicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we said that you need to be aware of what you are saying. You need to be connected in your dua. Don't be the person who's making dua. Your tongue is moving, but your heart is somewhere else. You're thinking about the football match, but your tongue is moving. No. Somebody scores a goal and suddenly you stop the dua. No. Be fully concentrating on the dua. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said in Tirmidhi, عد الله وأنتم موقنون بالإجابة Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst knowing and being sure that Allah will answer you. وَأَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُ الدُّعَى مِنْ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ لَاهٍ And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to answer the dua from the heart which is careless and heedless. So many of us, we have that problem, right? We make the dua and we forget what the dua we were making. We start with one, we end with another. So we have to learn to concentrate. We have to have that connection of being attached to our dua and really showing to Allah that we really need this dua and the dua will be answered by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're making dua, what should you start your dua with? MashaAllah, barakallah feek, jazakallah khair, ahsant. So he said the names of Allah, he said remembering the names of Allah and saying the basmallah. 
Yes, very good. And you say salah upon the Prophet ﷺ. So imagine like we said, when you're entering upon a king, you don't just go to the king and say, yo, give me X, Y, and Z. You never go to a king and say, give me X, Y, and Z to anybody of importance. You go and you grovel. You say, king, how special you are, how amazing you are, the way you take care of your people. And this, who is more deserving of us groveling to him than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we ask Allah Azawajal, we go through His names and attributes. We say, Allah, you took care of me. You always solve my problems, etc., etc. Create that conversation with Allah Azawajal. And then send salah upon the Prophet Sallallahu And then make dua. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in Tirmidhi, once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard a person come into the masjid, and after the salah, he made dua quickly. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Ajilta ayyuhal musalli, that you were very hasty in the way you made dua. He said, إِذَا صَلَيْتَ فَقَعَدْتَ Once you've prayed and then you've sat down, فَحْمِدِ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِمَا هُوَ أَهْلُهُ Make um, veneration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to that which Allah is deserving of, meaning His names and attributes and His beautiful qualities. وَصَلِّ عَلَيَّ And then send, send salah upon me. ثُمَّ ادْعُوهُ And then make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the formula for a successful dua. After adding to it, presenting it with good deeds. First and foremost, you grovel to Allah Azawajal. You extol his names and attributes and virtues. You send salah upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then you make your dua. In this way, it's something that you come with the correct mannerisms. And inshallah, your dua will be answered. From the mannerisms of making dua, is that you should choose supplications and words which are good. Common sense, right? And also you should choose words and supplications which are concise. What do I mean by concise? Not extremely long with no need. Like you find sometimes some of our Imams, may Allah have mercy upon them, in Taraweeh, the Dua is longer than the Quran. Yeah, Qira'atul Quran fi Taraweeh, Rubsa'a, is 15 minutes, but the Dua is the Dua is half an hour. This doesn't make sense. One of the companions as narrated in Abi Dawood, Abdullah ibn Mughafil, radiallahu uh, anhu, he heard one of his sons saying the following dua. He said, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-qasr al-abyad an yameen al-jannah idda dakhaltuha. He said, Oh Allah, I ask you for a white palace on the right of Jannah as soon as I enter it. So he's giving detail after detail, right? So this companion radiallahu anhu said, Ay bunay, salli Allah al-jannah wa ta'awwad min al-nar. Ask Allah for Jannah and seek refuge from the nar. That's it. فَإِنِّي سَمَعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ For verily I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say, سَيَكُونُ فِي هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ قَوْمٌ يَأْتَدُونَ فِي تُهُورِ وَالدُّعَى There will be people in this ummah who go beyond, who go to extremes in making dua and purification, in making purification and dua. So when you make dua, there's no need to go on and on and on. Stick to, the dua, stick to something which is concise, but repeat that concise dua regularly. No need for lots and lots of information. Allah Azawajal knows what you need and He will give you what you need and want by the permission of Allah Azawajal. What are from the most concise du'as? Aywa, du'a, du'a of the Prophet Sallallahu or du'as which are found in the Quran like the brother mentioned. Right? These for sure are the best of the du'as and the most concise of the du'as. So every time we come across a du'a which is in the Quran, we should try to learn it. If we come across a dua which is known that the Prophet Sallallahu used to recite this, we should try to learn it because it's better than our words that we can produce from ourselves. However, like we say, there's no problem with you making your own dua as long as you stay within the framework of that which is uh, mannerisms. The Prophet Sallallahu as in Bukhari and Muslim, he guided us that after the salah, meaning at the end of the salah, you should make dua. Not after you've made taslim. It's better for you to make dua before you make the taslim. Because in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet said, Then the person, after making the du'as, which are recommended in the salah or obligatory, before he makes the salim, he goes ahead and makes du'a to Allah for anything he wants. Okay? So it's better for you to make the du'a in the salah. Why? Apart from this hadith, why? Ahsanta. Because you're closer to Allah and one more thing which we started off with. 
you're extolling Allah and you're doing a good deed, right? So remember we said when you present your dua to Allah, you want to present it with good deeds. So here you're in the midst of a good deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the better places for you to make dua. Where else in the salah is it recommended for us to make dua? In the sujood ahsant, mashallah tabarakallah. In the sujood, the Prophet sallallahu said, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُنُ الْعَبْدِ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدِ فَأَكْثِرِ الدُّعَى The closest that you are to your Lord is when you are in sujood. So increase in making dua. So when you're in the sujood, increase in making dua. Because that is the place now you have taken your most valuable thing, which is your face. Nobody's allowed to touch your face, right? And you've put it on the ground for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you've established the servitude to Allah and therefore Allah answers when you call upon him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So increase in that position. Tayyib, what if you don't know Arabic? What do you do? <clears throat> Speak in any language you want. But it's better for you to learn the Arabic dua and say it in Arabic. But if you cannot do so for that period of time, speak in any language you want as long as you understand it. Don't start speaking Chinese, okay? Speak in any language you want as long as you understand it, of course. <clears throat> uh, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the narration of Bukhari that it's recommended إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ سِيَحَ الدِّيكَ فَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَإِنَّهَا رَأَتْ مَلَكًا That if you hear a rooster making, what does a rooster do? He crows. When the rooster makes that call, then call upon Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for verily it saw an angel. وَإِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ نَحِيقَ الْحِمَارِ فَتَعَوَّذُوا بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهُ رَأَ شَيْطَانًا And when you see the donkey braying, hear the donkey braying, then seek protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for verily it saw a devil. What should be avoided with the construction of your dua? What should be avoided with your voice when you're making dua? You shouldn't you shouldn't go out of your way to make the dua rhyming. Because Ibn Abbasir radiallahu anhu, he said to Ikrimah that the companion, the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and his companions, they used to avoid making their duas rhyme. However, if this happens naturally, due to the balagha of the person, due to the eloquence of the person, then that is well and good. Because we know many of the duas of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they used to rhyme, right? But he wouldn't go out of his way to do that, right? So that's what is being said here. Don't go out of your way to try to make your uh, dua rhyme as many people do in Salat al Tarawi. They come with dua and they have to make it rhyme at every point. This is something which should be avoided. But if it happens naturally, <coughs> then that's well and good. Another very important etiquette of dua is that you must have sabr, you must have patience. Patience is so important when you're making dua. You know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what He wants when He wants. Not what you want when you want. What do you prefer? Do you prefer that Allah gives you what you want when you want or that He gives you what He wants when He wants? Whose choice do you prefer? Your own choice or Allah's choice? Tell me. Allah's choice, right? Because Allah is full of wisdom, compassion. Everything He does for His cre creation is out of wisdom and compassion. So I'm asking Allah for X, Y, and Z. Allah, this woman, I have to marry her. I can't live without this woman, right? But Allah SWT will give me something better, maybe. For example. So Allah SWT chooses for you that which is best. So have patience. Your dua will be answered in the way which is best for you. The Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari Muslim, لا يزال يستجاب لعبد ما لم يستعجل A person's dua will be answered continually as long as he doesn't become hasty. يقول قد دعوت قد دعوت فما أرى أن الدعاء يستجاب له فيستحسر إن ذلك ويدع الدعاء. He says I made dua, I made dua, I made dua, but I didn't see my dua become answered. So at that point he becomes despondent and he leaves alone the dua. His dua is not going to be accepted then. Why? Because he became impatient. Allah Azza wa Jalla sometimes, like we said, He's going to give you the answer of your dua when He knows it's best for you to be answered. And he'll give you that which is best for you to be answered. And there's something else. Why else is your dua delayed? Because Allah loves to hear your voice in that situation when you are calling upon him. So Allah prolongs the answer to your dua. Because the sound of you calling upon Allah and the way your heart is calling upon Allah, he loves that. 
So you also be happy that Allah is prolonging that for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something which is extremely important for us to do when we make dua and imperative for us to remember is what is mentioned now from the mannerisms. In the hadith in Sahih Muslim, it mentions that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the verse in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, kullu min al tayyibati ma razaqnakum. Thumma dhakra, uh, the Prophet ﷺ quoted the verse in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, where he said, O oh, you who believe, eat from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided from you, the lawful and the, the wholesome things. That which is lawful and wholesome. Thumma dhakra rajal, yatilu safar. Then he mentioned a man, the Prophet ﷺ, who is taking a long journey. What happens when you take a long journey? We know your dua is answered for you, right? It's one of the causes. He's in a terrible state. He's dusty. And he's in a terrible state. He raises his hands to the heavens. This is also another reason for your dua to be answered. Because you're establishing tawheed, rububiyyah with Allah. Right? He calls upon Allah as his Rabb. But... But his food was from haram. His drink was from haram. His clothing was from haram. And his whole situation is that of haram. So how is his dua going to be answered? The Prophet ﷺ said. So the serious issue is that one of the main reasons that stops our dua from being answered is because we're swimming in sins. Take this hadith now and establish it on a global level. Establish it on the level of the Ummah. How many from the Ummah are still involved in shirk? How many from the Ummah are still involved in bidah? How many from the Ummah are dealing in riba? How many from the Ummah are cheating and harming? So many sins. How do we expect the state of the Ummah to change? People, they want to protest and sometimes that is good. People want to shout and scream. People like to make a lot of noise. People like to have lots of debates of how the ummah can change. But they don't want to do the real work. What is the real work? The real work is we have to change ourselves. We have to purify our belief and we have to purify our actions. Tasqiyatun nufus. We have to purify our belief and purify our actions. That is the only way that things will change for us and this ummah. Inna Allah la yughayru ma biqawm hatta yughayru ma bi'anfusihim. Allah is not going to change the state of a people until they change their own state. Their own state meaning their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How they behave with Allah subhanahu So this hadith is very important in understanding the mannerisms of making dua with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the guaranteed times for making dua, guaranteed stamp of approval on it, right? So get excited now. One of the guaranteed times for making dua being answered is as mentioned in Bukhari where the Prophet sallallahu said, يَنزِلُ رَبُّنَا تَبَارَكَ تَعَالَى إِلَى سَمَاءِ دُنْيَا كُلَّ اللَّيْنَا that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heavens every night in the last third of the night in a way which is befitting his majesty and he says Man yad'uni lahu. who is calling upon me that I may answer him Man yas'aluni who is asking me a mas'ala that I will give it to him Man yastaghfiruni lahu. who is there seeking forgiveness and I will forgive him so in this time it's a time where your dua is guaranteed. If you're really serious about a matter, you're really serious about achieving something, then this is one of the times where you have to get up in the last of the night and you have to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your dua will be answered for you, inshallah. When else, apart from what I mentioned in this short lecture, are recommended times <laughs> for dua to be answered? <laughs> when it's rainfall. So don't take out your umbrella, take out your dua book, right? As we say. Let the rain fall upon you, raise your hands and make dua. When else? Between the adhan and the iqama. Between the adhan and the iqama of every salah is a beautiful time to make dua. When else? Say again. When you're traveling, excellent. When else? Yawm al-Arafa. When else? Fi nuzul al-Matr. Qal had al-Akh. Zakallah khair. When it's raining. When you're on Hajj, for example, exactly, especially Yom Arafah. Come back to you. No. The last hour before Jummah, according to many of the ulama. The last hour on Yom al Jummah before Maghrib. Ziyatul Marid, Ahsant. When you're visiting the sick person and you're in the presence of the sick person because now you are surrounded by angels. So that is a great time to make dua. When else? 
when you're fasting and you're when you're fasting during the whole fast and when you're about to break your fast and also when you're drinking or with drinking what is the special drink zamzam when you drink zamzam water that is the time also to make dua musafir when you're traveling what about come on what else guys come on huh so Jude, we said it in the lecture <coughs> what else Ahsant, yes. You make dua for your brother without him knowing. What's the benefit of this? The angels, okay, good. The angels will make dua for you, inshallah. Right? This is what the Prophet mentioned. When you make dua for your brother and he doesn't and he doesn't know that, then the angels make dua for you. Is it permissible for you to ask the people to make dua for you? So this is something which is different from amongst the ulama, right? Based upon the hadith of Umar radiallahu anhu, where he would ask those who were traveling to make dua for them, right? Some of the ulama said it's authentic, some said it's not authentic. But Shaykh Uthaymin, he mentioned a beautiful point in, in Riyadh al-Saliheen, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, look, I'm not saying to you don't make dua, but I'm saying it's better for you to make dua yourself because your attachment to Allah azawajal in that mas'ala is, is better and closer than nobody else's attachment. And also, he said, Make, ask a person to make dua not with the intention of only your dua being fulfilled. Ask him with the intention of him benefiting. Who is to feed? How does he benefit from the dua? Because now he's doing a righteous deed. He's doing a good deed for the brother, right? By making dua for you. So also he gets benefit. So these are from the words of wisdom that they said. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa sallam. Anything which is correct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shortcomings and mistakes were for myself and shaitan uh, if you have any questions on the topic then feel free inshallah <coughs>